Welcome back to Cloudy Reviews. And our read along of The Wheel of Time. Book one of the world. In this episode, we will be going through chapters 21 through 26. There's so much here to dive into. Get ready. And here we go. Chapter 21. Listen to the wind. Very nice. It is. This is an interesting chapter. In this chapter, uh, Nanive wakes up. She is sitting at the River Aranel, which is a huge river. She wakes up and she is alone. Well, she does have her horse. What is sneaky little Nanive going to do? She thinks on how she happened to come across, I believe, about 10 trollocks when she was trying to flee. That they smelled the air, then turned, leaving her behind. Hmm, what's that all about? Earlier, we learned about uh, some Trollocs hunt by smell and sight, so I'm guessing they have the scent of their prey. She not prey? Well, they knew she wasn't the one they were looking for. And she starts to try to find her people. Determined to go as far as need be with the smell of wood smoke, she tied her horse to a tree and stalked forwards to see if it was from friend or foe. And? It happened to kind of be both. <laughs> Excellent. It, it was Lan and Moraine. She uh, listened as Lan gave a report. They are all gone. No trollocs to be found. He talks that there had to be around 1,000 of them. So we went from 300 to 500. Now we come find out had to be at least 1,000. Are they multiplying? Hmm. How did they uh, get here without being caught, without being seen? They're a long way from the blight. Oh, I want to say, but it'll ruin it. Yes, don't say. There is talks by Moraine of traveling that may be forsaken or lose. A, a race down river. The bond has been broken. All of a sudden, she put her cup down and called Nynaeve Ford, which shocked land. He is a man that is not stuck up on easily. Nynaeve came in like a bull in the china shop. What filthy Aes Sedai plots do you have them uh, trapped in? I wouldn't drink your tea if I would die of thirst. Yeah, what a, what a bit of ray of sunshine Nynaeve is. Well, I mean, she had just gotten past like 10 Trollocs, had to sleep in the woods. Um, I mean, it's it's not... She's not at her finest right now. I would take the offered drink for sure. Moraine kind of busted her bubble saying that Nynaeve can channel. She can use the power. Honestly, this kind of busted my bubble too. Because she tells Nynaeve that this is the reason she was able to find them at the end. And I was a little sad about that because I really wanted Nynaeve to be that good of a tracker. Well, she's kind of both. There was some talks over how everyone in the villain praised her for listening to the wind or healing stuff. Everything except for uh, praised her on everything except for her age. She is too young to be a wisdom. How she could sense it when they met, even though she was looking for someone twice her age, even while looking for a younger wisdom. Then we learn about a woman first touching of the source, maybe getting something you always wanted or something saves her, then becoming ill. That Nynaeve used the power to heal. Paranor Egwene, it had to be because uh, Christy was talking about she came straight to the end and those was the two that were still there at the moment. And so, sort of with, um, I don't think she wanted to admit that Lorraine was right, but she grudgingly tells her that it was Egwene, that Egwene had breakbone fever, and that once it is in its prime, I guess you would say, there's really nothing you can do for the person except let them work through it. But at the time, she didn't know that. Yeah, she was only an apprentice herself at the moment. And she had kept a grain before, so she loved her and wanted to heal her so badly that, boom, she did. The wisdom came back. Egwene was fine. Then a week later, Nynaeve fell sick. And looking back, Nynaeve did note that when the wisdom returned, she seemed way more concerned about Nynaeve than she did about Egwene. It was like she knew, or that's how I took it. Yeah, I think she might have sent something there, which maybe she could channel too. Well, we were finding out some wisdoms 
can actually listen to the wind and some just kind of say it and do the best with herbs and home remedies. And my interpretation of that is those who actually can listen to the wind are those that have some grasp of the power and those who just say they can don't really actually have the ability to touch oh, the power. Yeah, I, would believe, I agree with that 100%. They talked for a bit and Nynaeve basically admitted using the power. She said that if she learned to, to control it, so can Egwene. She don't really want to uh, want Egwene to go off. She she want everything back how it was. And you know what? I feel her on that. I know you're not a Nynaeve fan, but man, this has been a lot of change for all these people. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, Trolley showing up winter night. I mean... I just want things to go back to normal, too. I think they have a new kind of normal. Ugh. Nynaeve thinks on how the woman she apprenticed to lost her first apprentice, the way Moraine explained. Moraine explained that I said I search for girls who can channel to take them in and help them train. Then Moraine dropped some pretty kick-butt news that Nynaeve would be stronger in the power than Egwene, and Egwene will be one of the most powerful Aes Sedai they have seen in centuries. The old blood runs strong, folks. This is pretty cool. Maybe we have multiple coming-of-age stories, different tropes going on. Oh, he is masterful the way he weaves all of this in. It's amazing. Well, Nynaeve came out of her character and asked Moraine, Please do not tell anyone. <laughs> that was very out of yeah. character. Meek does not, or polite, doesn't come to her easily at all. Moraine tells Lan, time to go. We head south. I fear the wisdom will not be coming. Nynaeve will like, oh, yes, I will. You can't prevent it. And I wondered at this, like, it almost seemed to me, like, maybe Lorraine did that on purpose. As like a, um, yes. you felt the same yes. way. And I keep trying to think of the term that that's called. Uh, uh, you, reverse psychology, yes, like like having a little you. kid kid uh, telling them the opposite to get them to do what you want. Yes, and I I've, I've seriously been thinking, trying to think of that term for like two days. <laughs> because Moraine would say it is part of the pattern now. Then Moraine explains how she can track the boys, and they will go for the guy across the river. This would be pair and furs. Lan said he would go gather Nynaeve's horse. She was going to enjoy it when he came back without it. But she didn't even get that tiny little moment. No satisfaction. satisfaction there. He showed up with the horse. And this chapter ends with a verbal act of defiance to Moraine. Nynaeve told her, I can use the power against you. Did she actually say that out loud, though? I thought she was thinking it. I thought she said it out loud. Let's go to the instant replay. But I do think that that is an excellent end to the chapter. And, it, you know, you always display Nynaeve in such an unsunny way. I think this was definitely her looking on the broader side. I mean, she had to have the power. She was going to use the power against her arch enemy, her nemesis, Lorraine. She did not say it to her. She just thought it. The Aes Sedai was so confident in her power and her plan, she thought, but... If they did not find Egwene and the boys, all of them, alive and unharmed, not all of her power would protect her. Not all her power. I can use it, woman. You told me you're so yourself. I can use it against you. And so, good call. I think Lorraine, or Nynaeve, excuse me. I mean, definitely brash. Definitely kind of rash. But she's not stupid. I mean, look at what they've already seen Lorraine do at this point. Moraine, excuse me. I would not be uh, calling her out just yet till I learned how to really harness this power. Yeah, but Nynaeve is not tactful, I, I would say, at this point. At this point? Yeah. At what point does she become? Well, maybe we read on. We might might have this debate later. Uh-oh. But she is known for her fiery temper and carrying a big stick. Was she a redhead? I don't know if I uh, referred to her as beautiful or not. Red? <laughs> Uh, me a second. I am redheaded, people. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, chapter twenty-two. I don't think that she's redheaded though, because Rand was one of mm. the few. However, you know, I, dark hair, dark complexion. I was just thinking with that fiery temper of hers. Something else he has, folks. Chapter twenty-two. Path chosen. Perrin wakes, and he is wet, cold, and hungry. Sounded like a bad day. He knew he lost everything, his cloak, flint, and started thinking on what he could control. 
what he could accomplish in time. Fire a bow, catch some food, just working out the problem how to uh, resolve the issues. He started walking. Then after a bit, he saw a hoof print, one that had a horseshoe he knew all too well. But before that, he had asked himself, what if nobody else made it? What if Egwene didn't make it? And then he felt bad that he'd been considered that. And I gotta say, if I were in this situation, my first pick would be Lan and Moraine because the power doesn't really scare me. But um, he, Perry would be my second pick if I'd be stuck with somebody in this situation. He's very thoughtful, contemplative, and, and he sets to work like... He, he has a goal, and he gets there. Uh, that is definitely his character, and I wake up wet, cold, and hungry. I'm not worried about everybody else until I get warm, dry, and fed. And then only if he said three cups of coffee. He came upon Egwene and Bella. <laughs> He approached her and stared. She was doing pretty well for herself. She had Bella, a fire, some food. Then they talked over a course of action. Wait for Marine. Move on. What to do? Where to go? With Perrin taking lead, they decide on making their way to Camelin to wait on them. Okay, now I'm going to have to rewind just a little bit. Because I think that this is something really cool that Robert Jordan does. Because when um, when Perrin, before he saw the hoof prints, and he was afraid that Egwene and maybe the others didn't make it, he was also afraid of, if they did make it, how they would be doing. And he even noted, because Perrin is amazing, definitely one of my favorite characters, when he gets there, he's like, wow, I was worried about her and she's doing better than me because she already had the fire. She already had some food. And I think that Robert Jordan, um, even though very early on, the first go through this book, uh, at first I was like, oh, this misogynist man. And there's so many other things now that I really look at it like from the perspective of having read the book through once or all of the books through once that I can go back and say he really was not like that. I don't know how anybody could ever think he is. I mean, I never read a world where women were so empowered and... Well, we'll get to some of the points. I know you don't want me to bring them up now. Where um, historically uh, different different reviewers have, have felt like it, it displayed a misogynist sort of uh, male-centered atmosphere and world. But I think this is an excellent example here of where Robert Jordan makes sure that that doesn't happen. And I don't know, I mean, obviously, because I don't know him, didn't know him, but it it seems like all of his stuff is very purposeful. And it, it almost makes me think that he did this on purpose, is like all of these little things that he does to make sure that everyone understands the world and that it's not just a, a world which women are second-class citizens. All right, so... uh they decide on making their way to Camelin to wait on them. From his memories of Master Alvir map, he mapped out a route of travel staying away from the river and roads. Perrin asked for a bit more bread and cheese. Egwene wouldn't give him all, all of the control. She was like, no sir, this may have to last a little while. He stepped out the fire, time to get moving. He's not going to eat and he's at least going to get going. But I do think that maybe she should have thought a little bit more about that. I mean, she's not that big. He's much larger. He needs more substance. With Egwene on this. I mean, you got to you gotta handle your rations in this. You got Trollocs Chate looking for you. You're alone in the woods. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I'd rather have it for later than be full and need it later. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Pots and pans are a pain. Maybe they even have a stain. Call on Rain, the traveling tinker. Heck, we can even do the mending you've been intending. Chapter 23, Wolf Brother. So we have Egwene and Perrin traveling to Camelin, arguing over who gets to ride Bella. <laughs> and not arguing the way you think. No, arguing over who has to ride her, basically. After the argument of sorts, to take turns, I like how Perrin thought, leaders and stories, never had to put up with this. And how he felt bullied by Egwene. You got big Perrin, all muscle, feeling bullied by Itty bitty Egwene. Then he does say that the leaders in the story never had to deal with Egwene. When they set up camp, Perrin went out and got them a rabbit for supper. He found Egwene sitting by the sticks for a fire and was like, huh, 
You can't wish a fire. Get your flint and start a fire. <laughs> she lost it. She hasn't had that since she went swimming in the river. So we find out Egwene started a fire with the power. Which freaks Perrin out big time. But she can't make it work now. So good old Perrin made a fire bow and asked her not to try again. Tonight at least. <laughs> He only threw in the tonight, at least, because she was very adamant she would be trying again. She was like, would you give up your act? So, we're already seeing that she thinks of it as, like, an extension of herself, as, like, a weapon almost. So, would he give up his act? Hmm. Well, we are seeing that she is 1,000% bound and determined about this Aes Sedai and the power thing. Days and night went on as they kept traveling, with her trying nightly and failing. Then one day they came upon the smell of smoke. They had also been very unproductive with their little rabbit traps up until this point, too. They were very hungry, at yeah. least. Cheese and bread were gone. Someone is cooking rabbit. But Perrin felt very cautious, drawing it as he had Egwene and Bella wait as he went to investigate. I mean, who's the leader? He's, you know, he's got to protect her. Oh, but she's all big and bad with the power and all. I was seeing her. I'd be like, like, I'll chill with Bella. You go singe them. (laughs) She's still working on singeing. (laughs) He happened to find a sun-browned man lounging around a campfire. He wore clothes made from animal skins that still had the hair attached. Long graying brown hair, thick beard, a long knife, almost a sword. The fire had six rabbits roasting. Mmm, yummy. The man asked, are you done drooling? And called for Perry and his friend to come have a bite. That he hasn't seen him eat much the last couple of days and jokes about watching Egwene boss pairing around. So this dude been kind of keep an eye on them for a couple of days. Like, that's not freaky. Our new character in- introduces himself as Elias. And then Perrin got a bit of a shock. Elias has yellow eyes. I mean, he's already a little shocking with his unkept appearance and hairy clothing, but... Very one with nature vibes. <laughs> I bet he's vegan. <laughs> I bet not. <laughs> he is about to eat a rabbit, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> After they ate, Elias asked, What were they doing? Egwene was like, Heading to Camelin, and he laughed. They have been heading the wrong way for days. And this dude's been watching them? Well, but he didn't know where they were going. I mean, but what, do you think they're just like out for a nice little stroll in the forest? I, I'm I don't confused. think, yeah, I don't think he knew and just want to observe them for a couple of days, get a sense for them. Yeah, I think he got a sense for them. We learn Elias doesn't really like being around people. He doesn't go near cities or even farms. People don't like his friends. Well, I feel him many many times i don't like people I can, I can feel that. I consider myself a people person. Elias' <laughs> friends are wolves. They came to chill around the fire. It clicks in Perrin's head. The wolves have yellow eyes, just like Elias' eyes. And Elias talked to the wolves. Well, in a sense, you know, no biggie. One of them has the name Dapple, but it's really like a sense or a feeling. There are also ones with the names Burn. Hopper and wind. Yeah, it seems like wolf language is a lot more complex than ours. Yeah, since like the sun rising at dawn, crest in a hill with fog, all kind of weird stuff. We learned the history and how his condition starts his that the wolves yeah, <laughs> that like the that. wolves find people like him. Then a big piece of news: the wolves say that. Perrin can talk to them. He has the ability. So we'll change it from condition to ability. How about that? It does sound much more positive that way. Well, they went to spin their story, their fault story of who they are and why they are traveling. And unfortunately, Elias has the first ever lie detector test. The wolves can sense the lie. I do think it's really interesting that I thought it was a nice little... I don't know if it was meant to be an Easter egg, but the fact that they say they're from Saldea, and one of my favorite characters is going to be from Saldea. Yay! Mm. Then he told them he wanted to know about the Trollocs and Half-Man, that the wolves could sense it in their minds. And he hoped that they are not dark friends. I mean, dude's talking to wolves, and he's wondering about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
But he'd already kind of been mistaken for a dark friend because of it, right? Yeah. Well, Elias has the first or last lie detector test, so they had to tell him their real story. Well, except for the Marilyn dream, Elias was a warder, and the Red Eye tried to gentle him. But his condition is not like that. But it did take him off. Which, I mean, whole bunch of chicks circling me trying to take away whatever abilities I have. Probably take me off, too. Elias is a real cool character, you know. Warders are supposed to be, like, some of the fierce warders. And, you're like, I had to kill a couple of warders. Bad business killing warders. Like, just some, some work he had to do. Perrin told Elias that they had no options but to look to the Aes Sedai for help. And Elias offered that they could stay with them. The wolves will accept them. They heard of others. Yeah, they heard of others that can talk to wolves, but Perrin is the first they met other than Elias. Oh, can I backtrack for five seconds? Yes. Because I didn't catch it in time. But this has one of my favorite lines in here. <laughs> when, after they told their Sunday story and the wolves were, were letting him know, letting Elias know that it was all a lie and parents deciding whether or not that, that he's going to actually tell the truth. Oh, and I got a question about that too. Your thoughts. But... One of my favorite lines, Elias goes, I don't like killing people after I feed them. (laughs) That's a great line. (laughs) I mean, that's some Southern hospitality right there, if I don't say so myself. I don't like to kill them after you feed them. Well, do you think that relate to the old uh, time-honored tradition of, like, welcoming somebody in your home, bread and water? Kind of like uh, you saw it in A uh, Song of Ice and Fire, where they enter the Phrase Tower and, like, offer us bread and water. And well, then, it was broke, broken there, but... Yeah, but it was a big thing that it was broken, too. Yeah. Because it's expected that once you... You know, hospitality. It, yeah. Maybe if you're not their best friend, you're at least going to be hospitable enough not to kill them. I, I agree. But I wonder what you thought, because I was wondering when um, when the whole, when Perrin was trying to decide, did he want to admit the real truth or not? And the wolves started growling. Okay. So I was like, are the wolves growling because, A, parents taking too long? Like, they want him to come out with the story. Or is it like, B, can they actually sense that he's thinking about lying to them? Well, I think it was more of a, and I might be thinking about the wrong parts in the book, but like at one time, parent grabbed his ass and they yeah, growl. That's it. And yeah. then they're sitting and he, he thinks like, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact line, but right around there, you're having some thoughts of violence or having to fight off, and they're like, "Uh uh-uh, buddy. Mm -hmm. They they, kind of like how they sense and talk their names and stuff. They're able to read his mind, not only him get pieces from them. They could get the the sense of the thinking on violence and all that, and they're like, no, buddy, you don't want to go down that road. Yeah, because he didn't actually touch his axe. He was just thinking about it. Yeah. So, I was wondering if they were able to sense yeah. it or if it was just taking too long. Well, Perrin does not want to accept what Elias is saying. It can't be true, right? Not him. Then we get a great sense of Perrin talking about them making this decision to go to Tor Valen together. <laughs> and now that was a great piece. It was. Egwene, like, no, we're doing this, and Perrin puts on a show. He's like, oh, good. Yes, I think I will go, too. Good for us to talk this out, Egwene. I can totally see you doing that. (laughs) We learned that Dapple leads the pack, and they will go south with them in the morning. Another female power figure, folks. Wait, wait. Well, Perrin was quiet, and he could feel Burn leaving a dozen other young males. With this whole thing of taking them on, everything going on there, their pack kind of changed. Burn and some of the other ones had to had to kind of like pull away. You know, not so sure that's a bad thing with a name like Burn. Yeah, I don't Burn. know if I want him protecting me. <laughs> Burn got his scars from Trollocs or Fades and has some big trust issues and can't get behind the smell of Trollocs and Fade on, on their minds. Dude, we all got trust issues. Come on. Not me. I heard I have a relative living out in the Middle East told me if I give him my bank account and social security number, he was going to send me a great fortune. I can't wait. Guys, it is a really good thing that we do not share finances right now. 
Yeah. All right, that ends chapter 23. Let's keep going. Time for 24. Flight down the Arendelle. Or Arendelle. And another dream sequence. This one has a maze of thorns. We love dream sequences. Ren is fleeing the Dark One. Flicker. Ooh. Flicker. And a thorn pierced Ren's hand. He noticed that the stones on the ground were actually skulls. This dreams in with him looking to mirrors. Balsamon face? His face? One face? Was it like a merge? All of them merge into one? Or how did that go? I don't know. I feel kind of like it was one of those sequences, like with that movie that you made us watch. Um... With Russell Crowe last night. What was that? Unhinged. Yeah, where it was just like a whole bunch, like boom, 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 boom. Really wasn't a whole bunch, folks. No, at the beginning, the intro, where it was talking about like all that stuff, and there was a whole bunch of pictures all at once. Do, 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 do. Oh, the little uh, intro while we're going through names and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, like little news stories, little blurbs. But it was like snippets, and it was in a montage, and it was like, boom, 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 boom. Well, Rand wakes on the spray. He sticks his finger in his mouth and tastes his blood. That scares him, but it was only a dream, right? Okay, pause, because I can't let you go on without us discussing this. I have to know about this. When he was in the maze, he was like, I've heard if you keep turning the same way, that you can get yourself out of the maze. Is that true? Yes. Go print out a maze and go right every every time. You, you'll you go down some dead ends, but you'll work your way back out the dead end. And Oh, my goodness. You know what I think, guys? I think he needs to take me to a corn maze this year and prove this. Maybe the Rock Ranch will be open back up and have their corn maze. Well, people have always said there is power in dreams. The whole fallen dream, if you... Do not wake before you make impact. You will die whole thing. So there's that. Our Captain Domin is pushing his crew very, very hard. After a couple of days, the crew started getting tired of it. There was some disgruntled murmurs from the crew when he was not around. I kind of like dude. What dude? Captain Domin. I'm not really sure why he amuses me a little bit. Yeah, let's get into him some. I, I like him too. Oh, I'm surprised. Normally we don't like the same folks. Rand noticed that Tom stayed away from the crew as the murder to each other and would go around trying to spread some cheer. We know that Gelb tried to get the crew members on his side and put them against Rand, Matt, and Tom. Luckily, Gelb had earned a bit of a reputation. Tom tells Rand that they should worry about the dangers of mutiny. And that if, if if they did, they would leave no one to tell tales. Oh, uh, so how is Tom... Oh, this is this is great sequence. How is it that Tom is going to help the captain out? How is he going to help prevent mutiny? Well, he worked hard to keep morale up with entertainment. Even trained Matt and Rand in front of them, which they loved. Oh, I love it too. Because... At the beginning, when he first got on the ship, that's how he explained why they were with him. It's because they were his apprentices. So now he's going to teach them. Only Matt's like, oh, why do we have to do all this stuff? And Tom's like, I don't know how to teach except to really teach you. Yeah, I don't know how to pretend teach either. Teach or I don't. <laughs> Guys, I pretend teach every day. <laughs> The spray made it way down river. Ran noticed stones. They have been cut into figures, figures of kings and queens. They were weather worn. The crew were numb to the wonders around them. Ran noticed a, a shimmer to the air, sun beaming off of a tower of metal. This roused Matt with thoughts of treasure. The tower was shiny steel, no <coughs> rust, no openings. <clears throat> you know what? What I noticed that you forgot, I know how much you love Matt. So I want to make sure that we point out, and you don't just skip over it, that he sucks at the flute big time. Domin told them the real treasure is what you can see traveling the world. That Domin told them of an island in Tremelking. They had a hand coming from the ground holding a giant crystal spear. The island people care not for digging it up. And the sea folk only care for selling their ships and hunting for their core more. Ooh, that's a fun word. We hear of bones of weird animals strung together in Tanchico. Of weird, weird artifacts all over the place. And how he even gathered a couple himself. Mm, totally makes me think of museums with dinosaur bones. Exactly. 
Domin says some cool stuff. He said the world will put a hook in your mouth. You'll go off chasing the sun. And if you ever go home, the village will not be big enough to hold you. I'm not sure Rand thinks that. He's a little homebody. He misses his daddy. He's a sweet boy at this point anyway. No spoilers. Day four on the river, Rand was up 50 feet on the mast, laughing and Chuckling at the sights. What? Whoa, you didn't even, like, lead us into that. You were just like, boom, put it out there. Dudes, what? 50 feet on the, up in the air on the mast. <laughs> he is having, like, his own Titanic moment right now, guys. That is so what I imagine. He's up there like, I'm the king of the world! Just chilling. <laughs> no, he's having a Titanic moment. Well, he's laughing and chuckling at the sights. Then he does something strange. Oh, because it wasn't strange to be 50 feet up on the mast. I think they're kind of normal for lookouts, right? Um, I don't know. Have they have, have the bird nest up there? Yeah, but is he supposed to be up there? Uh, well, anyway, I guess they didn't have signs posted. No climbing. <laughs> Do not enter. I think you should try this on our next cruise. I right, keep a healthy distance. All right. So he kind of stood there, not holding or clinging to it, just kind of balancing. He lost his balance and almost fell. Then he heard Tom calling to him. Because Tom's down there with all the same people. If you're trying to break your neck, don't do it by following on me. And Rand was like, when did you come up? Tom said, when you didn't pay attention to people shouting, everyone thinks you're mad. Everyone was staring, but mad. Because he's the one who's really mad. <laughs> Ren grinned. You want me to come down? All right, then. He sprung forward, dangling by his hands. Then he swung, catching the rope, and slid down. The crew kind of clapped, but... Everybody's like, what this fool doing? Like, I think we should clap. But yeah, I mean, he's crazy. Did he mean to do that? That's no. He did a half bow and kind of got a little shock, staring at Matt, who was holding a gold dagger with a huge ruby on the heel. <clears throat> Seeing Ren, he hid the dagger, a dagger he took from Shadar Logoth. And after some pleading and stuff, Ren agreed to not to tell anyone about it. Tom showed up fussing at Ren, then Ren looked at where he had been. And was shocked at what he has done. So are they both freaking crazy? In their own ways. Hmm. I told Jay that about him all. And that ends chapter 24. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this paid advertisement. This is Lord Captain Bornhold of the Children of the Light. If you suspect any neighbors or friends of being dark friends, please report to a local group of Children of the Light. Walk in the light. Chapter 25, The Traveling People. Who are the traveling people? The Tinkers. What they tinkering with? Honestly, they really remind me a lot of gypsies. Yes, uh, I always uh, thought about like that, the whole gypsy wagons and everything, and even color patterns, stuff were a little more brighter for our tinkers. Mm. So, uh, Perry and Egwene are being escorted by Elias and the Wolves. We learn about parent abilities to tell where the wolves are, like scalping ahead. He can tell when they fall back to uh, keep a lookout behind. Then uh, parent dreams start to incorporate a wolf, guarding for what what is to come. Mm, I like that. It makes it seem like they're protecting him. Mm, I, I do believe so. But he's definitely not nearly as excited about his abilities as a Gwen. She's like, whoop, whoop, I touched power. Let me go and make this sizzle. And he's like, uh, I don't want to talk to wolves. I don't care what animal it is just about. I will love the ability to communicate with an animal. And? I said just about. Like, hey, get a wolf. I, w- I will probably get hummingbirds, which I would be totally cool with that. <laughs> Like like having little darts fly at people. (laughs) All right, so one night they were about to enter some trees to camp for the night, and they met some huge mastiffs. Mm -hmm. And mastiffs are really big dogs. That's what I would talk to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, calm down, butterfly. So Perrin pulled his sling, but Elias was like, no. Come to find out, they are harmless. They belong to the traveling people, a.k.a. tinkers. They're like 
preparing big old teddy bears. That's right. Egwene let out some thoughts of how everyone knows tinkers are thieves. I might even steal Bella. They should go somewhere else, but Perrin always wanted to meet the tinkers. I thought that was really interesting that Egwene is the one that like couldn't wait to get out and see the world, but she's like really kind of well, not even kind of. She's, like, super judgmental against the Tinkers. Yeah. And Perrin, who never thought he'd leave the Two Rivers, is all like, ooh, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. Kind of like a traveling fair, I guess. You see the colors. We learned the tinkers, tinkers are very formal, and Perrin should copy Elias. We make our way into their camp. They have colorful wagons. They are basically houses on wheels. They wore oh so colorful clothes and the wagons were painted so bright it should hurt the eye. A short, great hair, wiry man approached and welcomed him, asking if he knew the song. Elias responded in a way that sounded rehearsed, saying he did not know the song. The man said they seek still something about remember, see, and find. I bet they're Swifties. Nothing wrong with a little tea swizzle. Music sprung back to life. The gray-haired man, name is Rain. He asked about Elias' other friends. Rain is the seeker or leader of the band of tinkers. They are looking for a song. The gist. So Rain and Elias go back a bit. They, they've already met before, knew each other. Definitely some history there. You keep going. I got some questions as we move on. Mm -hmm. well, they went and sat with Rain and his wife for supper. And then a young man, their grandson, showed up. His name is Aram. And her name, why is it her name like Cloud or Shower? I doubt he he married a relative. <laughs> or, but, were, were the children preordained to marry at birth, named to go together? But like Ilya and Rain. It seems like different. I don't know. I see where you're going with. You got rain, you got arum, air. Mm -hmm. These people follow something called the way of the leaf. This means they will do no harm, not to anyone. You know, I thought about that, and I bet that there's a lot of people in fall that do not believe that leaves are harmless. So, you know, you got to rake them a lot. Mm, yeah. Slip on some leaves, maybe? Mm, or hurt your back while you're raking. No, we don't want to talk about hurt backs. Mm. We get a bit of history but between the Tinkers and Elias, how they both disapprove of each other's lifestyles. Well, Perrin got in on the debate, and Aram made a comment on Perrin. Old Perrin told Aram, I bet you get to run away a lot. And man, every time <laughs> I read or listen to that, I chuckle. Aram did not chuckle. Aram, Perrin took note about uh, Aram's expression. It did not look like he really wanted to follow the way of the leaf in that moment. I think that his granddad even said that, right? That he had some um, some trouble following the way of the yeah, leaf. Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone, and some people have, have trouble with it. Well, Miss Young Egwene, she ended up uh, running off with Aram to go... You know, uh, air mother fire. Because you forgot to talk about how handsome he was. Even Karen was like, well, I mean, I guess he looks like what chicks dig. Yeah, well, Aram made a little smooth comment about first rose of the sum spring to her, and Perrin thought he was gonna, she would chuckle at it or shoot him down, and she kind of smiled. Then he took a double take at Aram and said, I guess he, what a woman would like. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Rain's not there. Mm. After the meal, Elias and Rain f fired up some pipes, and Rain told of a story going through the traveling people. A band of tinkers were cross crossing the I.L. ways. Only certain people are allowed to cross the ways. Tinkers, glee men, peddlers, if they're honest. Uh, Carrying and merchants used to before the tree and war that the I.L. avoided tinkers. Anyone else may face grave danger from the I.L. We learned that I.L. men only sing battle chants for war and over the dead. Elias stopped him saying, <laughs> This story better not be about a song. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So we are learning that songs are very important to the tinkers. They travel searching for one by, by all means. Mm. And I think this is the point, if I'm not mistaken, that, uh, that Rain does a little... or. Almost does the little slip up 
And he's like, oh, no, um, I, I wasn't gonna, you know, talk about a song. I just thought since you were, and at that point, Elias gives him a look and he stops what he was gonna say. And he's, he covers it up really quickly by going, oh, well, you know, because you know a lot of people that have been around a lot of places. And that just made me go, what was he gonna say? I can't figure that out. Well, it would be a giveaway. We don't want to talk about giveaways. We'll, we'll get later. there. I'll have to tell me later. Rain was like, no, nah, I don't really know what it's about. So some young men travel into the Blight thinking they have a calling to go there and kill the Dark One. The Blight is a very dangerous place. It is the homeland of the Trollocs. Well, this group of tinkers found some young female Aiel. They are far to eyes my maidens of the spear. They were all dead but one, and three times their numbers in dead trollocs. They called the waste the dying grounds. Aiel warriors are fierce. She told the tinkers that Leaf Blighter, that is a name for the Dark One, plans to blind the eye of the world. Hmm. What is the name of book one of Will of Time? The Eye of the World. Dun, 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 dun. She called the Tinkers. The Lost People. The Lost Ones. He means to slay the serpent. Stand ready for he who comes with the dawn. Then she died. So Rain said, I have no idea what this means. I'll tell you in case you might know because you were once. Well, that was a fiery guy. Eli- Elias made a Fast hand motion, preventing him from finishing his sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I was talking about. He changed uh, changed to a, a friend and no many strange things. Yeah, totally they covered it up. Yeah. What are you talking about? So we'll get there. Ah, uh. uh, we got to read on. Sadly, Elias did not have an answer. We end this chapter with Egwene coming back from hanging out with Aram. They did some dancing. Then she started crying. Parent thought. I wish I had ran way with girls. <laughs> That's something that amuses me every time it happens. Every one of them thinks the other one has game. Mm. I mean, they all do pretty well. Chapter 26, White Bridge. Back on the spray, Tom is working hard, training Ran and Matt, the art of a gleeman. <laughs> Matt- Definitely working hard with Matt. So this is where you were talking about last chapter. Matt is not much of a flute player, but he has a knack for juggling. Then we have some talk over how the others are alive or dead. Then we hear a call for Whitebridge. Whitebridge ahead! They have made it to Whitebridge. Whitebridge was properly named for it had a huge art, milky white bridge that looked like glass, but... Couldn't was, be glass. Yeah, it would never slip, never slippery, nor cannot be harmed. Tom called it a remnant from the Age of Legend. I don't think Bell Diamond liked that thing. Why not? Well, because he was like, everything doesn't have to be from the Age of Legends. Yeah, but in the pre two chapters ago, he gave a speech of all the wonders. He gave a speech about all the wonders and traveling around and all the things you'll see. I guess he can even grow numb to some. Brandon, his excitement said, we made it, Tom, without a mutiny. This caught the ears of some of the ship hands. At their stop, Domnin kicked Gelb off his ship. Tom and Brandon and Matt departed the spray. As they did, Domin gave thanks to Tom's services. He realized well, what was going on. Even tried to get him to stay aboard to go to Ilion, where they are having a festival and are offering a hundred gold marks for the best telling of the great hunt. I think Tom was really giving it some thought, too. So, book two title is The Great Hunt. Maybe they get back on the ship and ride with them? I don't know. Let, let's there read them. Anyway, um, the reason that 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 was such a uh, not an option is Rand put his little foot down. He even gave Tom a nice bag of coin. We make it to an inn, and Rand wonders if all inn keepers are heavy with thinning hair. That was the only um, similarity between this dude and Egwene's dad, Master Alvier. Yeah, this inn has some. Half walls to divide in a section. Tom chose a table in, in the middle so he could keep an eye out for ears. They talked over what to do. The innkeeper came and said he had the usual Aes Sedai opinions. Hated them. He talks about the Aes Sedai or taking Logan to Camelin and to show him off to the Andor Queen Morgays. And Logan is a very significant, I think, because they even talk about how he is the first... Um, 
of the the false dragons they can actually channel like the last one couldn't actually do anything with power and and i think it's really showing that everybody's becoming more powerful he talks over Ilion called for the for the hunt of the horn any that will swear the hunter oaths, oaths are coming forward Rand ended up asking him about strangers. That they are looking for some friends while Tom was lost in thought. Haven't they learned just to keep their mouth shut up? And let shut Tom so do the talking. Yeah, apparently not. Tom wasn't happy about that. Then gave a general description, and the innkeeper was like, "No thanks. Get gone. Leave White Bridge." And this was like a huge. 180 for him because a second ago he'd been like, Oh, Gleeman, you know, I give you a, a good deal on a room and board, and you can. He talked about the great hunt. Tom gave a couple lines. He was like, Yes, yes, just like that. They'll, they'll come running, they'll fill the room. And now he's like, Dude, you be gone. Coming to find out, a Weasley weird man came asking about them, acting all strange, crazy. One minute, act like a king the next. Then the next day, a dark-clad, scary man started coming, asking the same questions. And the one that they were talking about, they came first. And, and this is the reason I thought it. They said he kept mumbling to himself and talking to himself. Is that put in vain? I would guess so, but I don't think he ever said for sure. I'm, I will put money on it, though. You can't see his face, but you feel freezing terror. They knew he was speaking of a fade. The innkeeper left them with requests for them to leave. Tom was like, let's take Dominant off. Domin offer. Rand was like, no, stick to our plan. Camelin. Matt snapped at Tom basically telling him he could go on his own. Tom gave a spill over. If he can tell this from that, and Rand noticed that Matt was gripping the dagger. Basically, um, Matt wouldn't have gone anywhere without Tom's help. He needs to recognize. Yeah, what does he think he has? Amazing luck? <laughs> Not yet. Then they heard talks of Trollocs, Borderland Fables. Gelb was in there drinking, telling him about the ship and Trolloc. Deciding it was time to go, they snuck out. At this point, Matt's even like, hmm, maybe the ship's not such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Tom's like, oh, that ship has sailed, son. While they went, Tom told of his nephew, Owen, and why Tom hates Aes Sedai. Not great uh, detail, just that you could say Aes Sedai killed him, and he hopes helping them will relieve his conscience. And he does mention that uh, when it happened to Owen, he was otherwise occupied. I think it's going to be a sheep. I would agree. Tom left them in the alley and showed back up in dark brown cloak which caused them to not recognize him at first his intent slip out the gate unnoticed telling Rand to slouch they started making their way to the gate then they noticed a fade heading straight to them people scattered yeah i would do matt pulled the dagger tom gave Rand his pack and told them to run to camelin to the end the queen's blessing shoving them tom Charge the fade. But even still, they could hear him yell, Run! Run! Very nice. Thank and you. this startled the fade. Pretty sure uh, fades are not used to common men charging them. I don't think that I would call Tom common. So, they did what Tom requested and ran. They have way better cardio than I do because they made it like out of line of sight of the city before they had to stop the gasping for breath. They're like 15. Nah. We're at 18, right? Tell us in the comments, how old are, are the two river lads right now? In the meantime, that finishes up the chapter for us. And uh, please come back for the next episode. We've owned.